So I guess I'll start with a few comments. Um, we, in general, it seems there's good support from the Congress for Arecibo for uh, building new instruments at Arecibo. And we need something to tell them that we want, uh, some design that we agree on. So that is the primary goal of having this meeting and perhaps some future meetings and uh, discussions. Um, this one, I admit, is a little bit heavy on aronomy, and that's probably all my fault. But part of the reason is because of the solar and space physics decadal survey that is about to begin. And also, I think that of the science areas of Arecibo, aronomy is the weakest in terms of support and ideas and things. So those two reasons. And, and thirdly, Paul Bernhardt called me up a few minutes ago and asked if he could stick in a few slides. So I've tried to insist that he not be too long about it, but he does have good ideas, a few good ideas to, to contribute. Um, so with that, I guess uh, I'll let Nicole go ahead about the uh, advocacy from ASAP at, with the Congress and uh, the general situation with that. Thanks, Brett. Um, let me share my screen really quickly. Um, it's great to see everyone here and thanks, Brett and Eliana for getting this going. I'll keep this brief. I just wanna um, tell you a little bit about what the Advocacy and Outreach Committee has been doing. We're all on the same page, I think. We're all working toward an AO 2.0. Um, but I will give you uh, the perspective from the advocacy side and what's been going on and, and hopefully so we can figure out how we can work together to make an AO 2.0 happen. Um, so let me just quickly tell you kind of the, the approaches, the activities we've been, we've been working on and the approaches that we take. Um, as Brett mentioned, we, we've been trying to engage policymakers in Congress so you probably all know there was a Senate resolution um, passed unanimously in support of Arecibo. Um, we've had multiple letter writing campaigns to Congress, just getting it on policymakers' radars um, that you know Arecibo exists, and, or and you know the collapse happened, and we need a you know we're, we're working toward its future. Um, and we've been meeting with advocacy groups and, and policymakers in the U.S. and Puerto Rico. Uh, so that is sort of one umbrella um, activity uh, category. Um, the other is to engage the, the wider science community. Um, so we've been trying to, you know, within our fields, reach out to our colleagues and let them know about the importance of Arecibo and the future of Arecibo. So we had two um, special sessions and a plenary talk planned for the AAS meeting in January, but it got canceled because of Omicron. So now in a the, the one in um, June, AAS 240 um, in Pasadena, we have an AO splinter meeting. Please come, if you'll be at this meeting, please, come on Wednesday, June 15th from one to three. Um, and there will also be a, a plenary talk by Hector Arce. Um, we will have a special session at SACNES, which is in San Juan in October, um, that will focus on Arecibo, both the science and the EPO. And then, you know, there's been letter write, letters written to, to societies, let, you know, National Society of Hispanic Physicists, Black Physicists, SACNAS, APS, AAS. So we're working in that regard to reach these scientific organizations. And we've written a, um, proposals to fund the advocacy work um, as well. And then finally, engaging the wider public. This, you know, to really drum up money and support, we're, we're trying to make sure that uh, everybody, not just policymakers and scientists knows about Arecibo. So there's been press releases, um, most recently on the decadal survey, the planetary decadal survey and all the support it had for Arecibo. Uh, lots of articles related to AO. Um, you know, we, we have a website, social media accounts. There's other projects like historical preservation that Lisa's leading. Um, other creative pursuits you'll see on our website. There's an elegy to Arecibo that was put together by some sound engineers. There's a lot going on. All of this you can find on the website. I'll give you that link at the end. 
Um, but more, let me talk about the current focus. Um, you know, as you all know, in order for the future to happen, we need money. And so we're, we're really trying to figure out ways to get Congress to put real support behind Arecibo. So um, there's, we're working right now to reach out to the conference committee for the Competes Act to put some money, to allocate some money for Arecibo in that. Um, but if that cannot work, we're trying to get it in, in uh, presidential budgets and things like that. So this is ongoing. Um, we're also asking the NSF to publicly state their, their intentions for Arecibo. They have withheld that info publicly and, and you know, especially that uh, some of the contract term dates are approaching and it's kind of urgent. So we're pressuring, we're trying to put pressure there. Um, so I'm, I'm finishing up the, the challenges that we're facing and this is where I think we can really work together. Um, what is the money for? When we're asking for things, uh, what, people want to know what, what are they going to spend their money on. So we're trying to focus and, and be unified in our asks. And that's where you know, this committee is amazing, you know, really helpful. And we hope we can figure something out so that message can be strongest. And then you know, another challenge is, are we connecting with the, the people who can help us the most? So if, if you want to join this side of the effort, uh, many of you here are on this committee and have done a lot of this work and led a lot of this work. But if, you, if you're not and you haven't, please uh, write this email address and, and ask to be put on this committee. Um, you can also find all this info at our, our ASAP website. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back over to you all so you can get on with the business of the technical work. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I guess we're up next with uh, some brief talks. And if Julio is here, he could go ahead about the decadal survey. Sure. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. <clears throat> so we have, uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes. OK, so we have a workshop on mid-March uh, March about the solar and space physics preparation for white papers and future of ground-based research, uh, you can see there in the title. And there were many talks, and you can see here the program. We met for uh, a couple of days or so. Uh, and for this group, I want to share uh, one of the things that uh, we're trying to develop a white paper with regard to uh, science that AO can do. Uh, these were some of the talks that were presented. Uh, and you, you, you can see here that there is a lot of um, talks that talk about the research that we would like to do. And that was the purpose, right? To justify what is the new science and new direction in research that we need to answer and what kind of ground instruments we need to accomplish that. And that was the center of the discussion. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have a uh, talk from Arecibo. You know, there was uh, not a focused talk on that, but I want to share one uh, uh, initiative I've been doing with John Matthews and other people uh, to in this regard. So there were, uh, and this, there is a report about this, and I can share the link uh, later with Brett so he can distribute to, to all the people interested in following up on this. Um, what we would like to do is, uh, let me see here. And we have a paper that it's almost ready for submission. Uh, let's see here. And this is one of the, uh, uh, last events that we were able to collect with, with uh, Arecibo. And uh, as I said, we have a paper that's almost ready to go for submission for publication. And we would like to use a paper as the genesis of a white paper for the Decada survey. And we want to demonstrate that, um, you can see here, right, these are observations with the uh, Gregorian ISR and also the line feed. And looking at the, uh, dash uh, rectangulars of two events that <clears throat> were um, that we think um, when we use the uh, ISR just to look at this localized, it doesn't look like such a big interesting thing, but we were having also the small radar, what we call the PD system, there's a portable radar that we developed here that can stay running at 44.42 megahertz while the heater was on, 
And we saw these uh, uh, interesting echoes that have all kinds of features and uh, structures that are very interesting to characterize. So we bring this concept called deep context, trying to bring into just a very simple Cape 2 uh, observation. So nothing exciting, nothing like these big storms that you know we usually publish. But this one was you know with a KP of two. Yet we have a very interesting um, uh, instrument, uh, an HF system that they can show that uh, you know very interesting structural develop. So we went ahead and looked into GPS and uh, a number of sensors available in our community. And we were able to uh, also analyze the conjugate point of uh, Arecibo, looking at into these uh, delta V tech kilograms. And we can see that you know, there is something happening at these mesoscale levels. And further on, we went into analyzing the solar wind and activities uh, that we can capture from the Omni and SuperMac uh, databases. And the main message that we wanted to bring up, and this is, I think, a good justification for a white paper at the Decada survey, is that a local you know, uh, type of spread F that appears at AO uh, is a manifestation of a larger system that is uh, evident in these delta VT structures that I show. And we're calling for what we said, deep context studies or radar uh, systems into looking at the big picture, right? Looking at all these um, systems of systems approach and trying to see how a very small, perhaps not um, very low event is actually not, uh, um, it's meaningful, right? And we need to have long-term observations, uh, ground systems observations, you know, to study the climatologically and trying to understand <clears throat> what is going on. We think that there is a coupling between the spread F at mid latitude with the equatorial spread F. It takes, of course, a few hours to see that. And in the paper, we say that, uh, which we point out that importance of society uh, supporting these type of facilities to continue research in areas that can uh, um, bring new discovery and science. So I will share the links and you know efforts that we're trying to do with regard to this and also the uh, outcome of the list of initiative for white papers and I welcome everyone to join. You can just join and sign up for these white papers that we're trying to work, which I think they announced uh, I think they were going to announce, uh, you know, this week when these white papers are going to be due. I haven't checked. Bray, do you know when the white papers are due by any chance? Have they announced? No, I haven't heard. Um, about they the told thing... us that May 3rd or something like that. It will be, I mean, they were closing the nomination, right, by May 3rd. I've heard various dates suggested, but uh, <laughs> nothing definite. Although uh, I was told by Art Charo that there would probably be two, a two month window from when it's announced to when they're due. Well, there was an email that came through the uh, SPA, the, you know, AGU SPA about that, or it's either, uh, I, I don't remember which one, I get too many emails is they notifying us that we should be working on this white paper because after the nomination ends, probably we have just a month. Although I heard in the workshop that we have three months and now you are interpolating bread and saying two months. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it is more than one month because uh, I think my understanding is, you know, having uh, white papers that support uh, science, right? Science that Arecibo can continue to make contributions is really, really important, right? I mean, so Leo, that we could, yeah. Julio, this is Shikai here. Can I ask something? Sure. Uh, hi, yeah, nice presentation. And uh, I, I was talking with ASPI and she mentioned that uh, they, like NASA and NSF, they, NASA especially is going to have a panel. First, they will decide a panel and then they will come uh, to the conclusion like when the papers are due. So I was also working on a white paper, which is almost ready and I will circulate it to you and Brett and to John Matthews and some other people. 
So if you want to endorse or be part of it, you are more than welcome. And it is focused on the current capabilities and the science that we can do from Recibo. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Shika. Sure, I'd, be, I'd love to endorse your work and work with you too. And I welcome everyone also to, we really have to show our presence aggressively, I think. I mean, that, that will yes. really ask yes. everyone. We have to. I agree, yes. So, yes. Uh, it is based on some recent results. And I also, I included your, like, just I have referenced your paperwork, but I showed some plots. And so your feedback feedback will be more than welcome. So I will after this meeting is over, I will send the draft to you guys. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Shika. Yeah. So uh, I think um, you know we're also having um, you know a CEDA workshop that's coming in June. Um, so I think uh, since they haven't announced the date yet, I think you know many of us are trying to uh, join efforts and support each other. But I, I, my suggestion is that really, we really need a strong presence in the decadal white papers for, uh, for an yes, yes, exactly. And also I want to say that at the CEDAR workshop, our community should actually uh, do a um, workshop like why Arecibo location is uh, important and why we need Arecibo, uh, why the community, because I felt that in the workshop, uh, there was no interest uh, uh, for like uh, re refurbishing Arecibo or like uh, no one like uh, when Tony Weinaken gave a presentation about Amizer, bringing Amizer to Arecibo, there was pin drop silence and I was kind of shocked that no one was really uh, backing up that idea. So we really need to revive this interest at the CEDAR community. So we should have a special workshop, like, you know, just not a workshop, uh, town hall kind of thing or something uh, for Arecibo that would like somebody should organize and we should include Dave Iso and uh, uh, sure. Ian Kodeki and things, uh, people who are like, you know, well known in ISR community too. So I th Sheik, I think that's an excellent idea. And if, if, if I may, if I may, Brett, can I suggest that maybe Cristiano, Shika, and you know, the leaders at Arecibo you know, lead, I mean, the workshop has been decided. We have a schedule for CEDAR already that has been published, but, but that doesn't mean that we cannot have a town hall or call for a community to have after the sessions, you know, yes. maybe in the evening or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Okay, sounds like a good idea. We can discuss that af after this. Um, any more comments? Uh, this is Paul Abel. I, I, um, many of you don't know me. I, I think Mike Nolan does, but um, I was on the planetary decadal, um, and the only thing I will emphasize is that um, having white papers, lots of white papers endorsed by the community, is really, really helpful. So uh, for this um, decadal that you're uh, planning uh, moving forward, I would strongly recommend getting in uh, really good uh, white papers and several of them with strong endorsements from the community. Uh, thanks for that comment, Paul. And I have heard a similar comments from others as well. So maybe we, we could uh, keep that in mind. Um, other comment? Uh, okay. Brett Christian here. Sorry, my yeah. dear. Kind of uh, we do have our previous white paper, right? That we put together about the O2.0, where we have the executive summary. That's about maybe four pages. We already have 1.400 endorsements there. Would be this strong to submit to the decadal survey? That's something that's already done, maybe change a little bit to make more, I don't know, uh, easy or adjust for the, the, the ECHO survey. Um, yeah, I guess this is, we, we, I, I, I'm not sure if, are you talking about the NGAT white paper or a different? Yeah, paper? yeah. No, because the ideas are there related to RSC and what we have in mind, right? Right. Yeah, also so that because of the location. And they are, we already have, a, uh, 1,400 endorsements from scientists all over the world. 
Right. Well, may, maybe uh, make a version of it that focuses on the topic of the decadal and we could... Yes, exactly. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Thanks. Okay, so we will have more time for discussion after these short talks. And so why don't we go on to Eliana. Uh, Eliana, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Let Great. me one second. I'm sharing my screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, second, I close this. Oh, sorry about this. No, I say this. Okay, this is an idea that I have. When we were planning this um, workshop, we were thinking that we should concentrate in the design, but this is gonna be driven by science. And then uh, this is a homework that I had um, for getting many, many science objectives of what this low latitude and mid latitude incoherent and scattered radar is very important and what we could do as a scientist with an incoherent scattered radar, like in a receiver location or low and mid latitude location. This is, the ionosphere is very complex and in low latitudes and mid latitudes is even more because we have forcing from the neutral atmosphere from below for lower altitudes, from higher altitudes, from the sun. We have forcing that is coming from high latitudes. We have forcing that is coming from equatorial latitudes. We saw that Julio was presenting something that was coming from a spread F that is equatorial. We have many, many things that they are acting in the low and mid latitudes. And this is why having an ISR at mid latitudes and low latitudes is very important. There is something that is a fact, that is when we lost Arecibo, we lost a capability, very important capability. Right now, we don't have an operational ISR at low latitudes in the American sector. There are just two new radars in China that are coming up as an ISR, Haina, one in Hainan Island that is new. I'm not sure if it's operational, it's operational yet, and the Kunming radar that is a little bit smaller and also the MU radar in Japan that I'm not sure if it's operational. It, didn't post, it hasn't posted data in Madrigal since 2018 or something like that. There is another one that is Miston Hill in, in US, in the continental US, but it's mostly mid latitudes to high latitudes, but we don't have an ISR at low latitudes. There is another fact, there is no other ISR had the sensitivity at the former Arecibo, not even Jicamarca. It's getting close, but it's not even Jicamarca. Arecibo was having a res high resolution of 100 meter, 150 meters per second. The frequency resolution was 0.7 kilohertz and so on. And no other uh, radar, ISR radar is able to match that, in, that from the former Arecibo. We have a wish list for the what would Arecibo could do, like an ISR could do, like in terms of electron density and so on. You can read the list. But something that is very important here is that Arecibo was able or was starting to map the magnetic field. He was able to detect the gyro line. And that was the only one that was doing it. And we had studies like Heisel and, and Yuha that was doing these kind of studies. We were able to detect neutral winds in the lower ionosphere. No other ISR is able to do that. We were able to detect plasma line even at night. This is a, an example of UHAS here, uh, detecting plasma line at night. No other ISR was able to do that. It will be ideal for the new ISR to have that with the highest time range and frequency resolution using a multi-dynamic uh, radar point of view and also have measurements over a large region, not just a needle point like it was before, but I have a, a large region mapping a, a large region. When we lost Arecibo, we also lost a source of calibration and diagnostic for instrumentation for ionospheric and other kinds of instrumentation, like ground base and satellites. Um, Dale Ferguson lost a big source of diagnostic for satellite studies and, and so on. We also lost a source of validation for space and atmospheric models and weather forecasts, especially for low and mid latitude. There is not a source of validation, uh, ISR source of validation for these kind of models. This is a wish list, uh, uh, kind of the, what we could do with an ISR. You can read it. There is, a, a, if you think of more ideas, there are more. And, and I'm, I'm just gonna go a little bit over but the ideal thing for this ISR at low latitudes will be to study ionospheric composition, 
And like, for example, Nestor Aponte was doing these transitions from O plus to H plus and, and helium plus. And there are helium plus regions that we were able to detect with Arecibo. We were trying to study that. There is no other ISR radar that can be is able to do that. We were able to study ionospheric layers. Specifically, one very important was the descending layer that was less than one kilometer thick. There is no other ISR that is able to detect these uh, uh, layers. And this is a study from uh, Jonathan Kroll in 2020, studying this and comparing with the uh, uh, models. We were doing uh, top site studies like ion flow and helium escape. We were doing d reuse studies, collision, temperature, temperature transition, electron density, neutral winds. We were studying mid latitude gradient drift instabilities, temperature gradient drift, electric field penetration and solar ionization, low latitude and uh, NILS studies, a study of the mid latitude RF Aurora. I have a picture here from the Hive cell from a coherent radar located in St. Croix. We were studying the atmosphere and the ionosphere coupling. And this is very important because there are applications, very important applications right, right now, like the expansion of atmospheric weather forecast to ionospheric altitudes, that they cannot be done if we don't understand this ionospheric coupling at low latitudes and mid latitudes. We were studying irregularities, ionospheric irregularities, like uh, gravity waves, like this paper of Frank Jude. Um, we were studying tidal planetary waves characterization in the D, E, and F regions with neutral wind estimations. This is neutral winds from Dave Heisel. Uh, we were mapping equatorial SPDF echoes and point and effect to low latitudes. And one example was Julius that he just showed that. And it will be ideal to have like measurements over a large region again to be able to do that. We were doing a, a study irregularities, global irregularities, like uh, sudden stratospheric warming. This is a paper from Larissa Goncharenko that is including um, Arecibo data. We're studying meteor and spike debris. It will be ideal to study spike debris at Arecibo, but we need to have tracking capabilities of objects moving and up to 10 kilometers per second. We, it will be ideal to have meteor, uh, magnetospheric uh, physics studies, like reaching higher altitudes with high power. Um, the idea will be reaching like 2,000 kilometers or more, and that will complement with the uh, space weather forecast involving the detection of high ionospheric echoes. And even in uh, studying interplanetary medium studies like solar wind and CMEs. That's for the ionospheric physics. And if you have more ideas, I can include it here. From the plasma physics point of view, uh, we were studying plasma wave characterization, specifically with ion acoustic waves and Larmor waves and, and electron gyro frequency waves, electron gyro waves. But there are more waves that we could be studying like upper and lower hybrid waves, electron Bernstein waves, and so many other like two members of the plasma wave family. It will be idea if we can do studies from parallel and perpendicular to B physics, and the Arecibo declination is 45 degrees. And very important now is that the declination is 12 degrees, and we have shown that the declination changed many things, like including uh, like neutral winds parameters and things like that. Uh, with Arecibo, they have been done like a lot of like ISR theory and Thomson scattering theory, like this uh, plasma line split near to the gy gyro line, which uh, this is from Asti Bad. Um, but they have been also studied from collisions and plasma line, like plasma line power recently. Um, studies for like plasma physics point of view in terms of uh, 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 using artificial, artificial ionization and testing all the plasma theories. And it will be ideal if the ISR can also detect a a rocket exhaust releases. And we know that the closest one is, is Cape Canaveral that is launching to east, but also is Wallops Island that is launching to south. It will be ideal to see if we can observe this kind of releases. From the, oh, what is happening here? From the uh, plasma lab point of view, not just the plasma studies, from the plasma lab, when we have the HF facility and ISR diagnostics, it will be ideal to study different plasma waste generation, different decays uh, mechanisms, like uh, parametric decays and, and so much more, like enhancement or depletion of cavities of the electron density, artificial descending layers, we don't understand them at all. 
uh, multiple harmonics of generation, of, of generation like using ISR and SE diagnostics that requires a, a wide ISR uh, receiving bandwidth, artificial field aligning irregularities when B is oblique over Arecibo, and detection of suprathermal electrons and supersonic particles, the transition from Maxwellian to non-Maxwellian behavior, and so many other things. Um, it would be also important to study natural phenomena when we can enhance the phenomena uh, using these uh, waves, the uh, powerful wave from the HF facility. And we can study like neutral variables, like neutral winds and, and diffusion and cooling rates and E cross B drift, for example. And it will be nice also to have like long propagation studies for communications and characterization of the D region and, ma and magnetosphere from the BLF and ELF propagation and HF propagation in the ionospheric medium. This is just a list. If you have more ideas, it would be nice to include it here and to have a good science support for this kind of instrument that we want to create. I don't know if there are questions. Any questions, comments? Elena, who are you working with for the orbital debris uh, meteor uh, aspect? I just took this from different papers, but I know, for example, that Julio has been working with meteors now that Julio is here. Um, and he can explain more a little bit of meteors. Uh, Julio meteor had to leave. <laughs> Sorry, Julio had to leave. I just oh, OK. <laughs> but there are studies of meteor trails that we can detect with, uh, I, uh, with ISR and coherent radars located near to the ISR. Yeah, no, it, it's fine. I was just wondering if there's someone that you were uh, working with. No, it is it is of interest. Um, and so, yeah, please, um, I might reach out and uh, write out, reach out to you and see if we can get more information because I, I think there's some interest. There may be some interest from some of the people that I know on our side. Okay. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Okay, I guess I'll, I think it's my turn. So I guess I will proceed. It's not Paul's, Paul was not going to proceed. Oh yeah, that's right, Paul. That's right, Paul, are you ready? I'm ready and okay. uh, able. I will okay, share the screen. It. Go for it, I'll, I'll do it after you. Let's see if this works. Can everybody see the large screen? New high power HF, or did I do the wrong thing? I think it's good, looks good. So uh, I'm just talking about a new high power HF system at Arecibo, Puerto Rico, myself, and NRL and Penn State and Arecibo are collaborators. So the new HF facility Arecibo has, has science drivers and there are three primary reasons for HF facility at Arecibo. Location, location, and location. Those are the three reasons. Location, uh, Arecibo is a pristine mid-latitude ionosphere. I am the chief scientist of HARP. And the chief scientist of HARP says that Arecibo has got the best ionosphere. Dense F region uh, lasting for hours after sunset. You can get air glow enhancements uh, way past midnight. Uh, tilted magnetic field lines that connects to another ionosphere over Argentina. Mid-latitude E region with sporadic E structures that you can cause to glow with HF as a high power flashlight. And there's weak D region for low absorption. The other location region is the proximity of ground facilities. We have an existing over the horizon radar facility in Texas, Virginia, and Puerto Rico that we collaborate with during heating experiments. There is a very large high power VLF transmitter at, at 40.75 kilohertz that 
we are very interested in seeing if the HF environment can amplify the ways produced from Aguada. We have also active experiments with every Cygnus flight starting June 2022. Cygnus is the spacecraft that supports the International Space Station and Arecibo is at low enough latitude that these burns, these Cygnus burns can be uh, uh, conducted over, over the HF facilities. We also have the Viper and Digison Inosons uh, on Puerto Rico, and we are putting out a, a large array of HF receivers along with Brett and, and possibly Namir in the Caribbean region to receive the signals from the HF transmitter. In other words, Arecibo HF is a transmitter and by appropriate radar waveforms, we could make it into a radar that could be received on the Caribbean islands. Finally, there are a lot of objects in space that go directly over Arecibo, and that includes the moon, the, 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 moon, the sun, planetary planets, and satellites. We currently use space sensors in low Earth orbit on the ISS, the Cosmic 2 sensors, we have CubeSats and a number of other low Earth orbit satellites that are launched from Canaveral. By being launched from Canaveral, they don't often go up to the higher latitudes, but they always go over Arecibo. The International Space Station resupply vehicles, such as Cygnus, Cygnus are available for these dedicated burn experiments. We also have overhead sun to use Arecibo as a CME radar, and we can also sound the moon with a ground penetrating radar at HF frequencies uh, using a Arecibo HF as a lunar radar. So in conclusion, Arecibo supports objectives for both planetary aeronomy and space science. So here are some examples from, from the years that I picked up what Arecibo has done. For the last 35 years, Arecibo has been one of the few HF facilities to make plasma irregularities that are uh, highly structured, long-lived, and, 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 diagnos and diagnosed, in this case, with the incoherent scatter radar. This is a, the pictures on the left are what a sporadic E-layer looks like. The green is from the E region. That's what a sporadic E uh, patch looks like. And then the red is the uh, echoes from the F region. Arecibo is the only facility that's ever made images of sporadic E layers in optics. The next picture shows the existing over the horizon radar systems, which we have had beams pointed over Arecibo during heat experiments at the same time that the Swarm E satellite that's got the EPOP instruments have flown overhead. And we've uh, made measurements with that. The proximity of these radars and the satellite orbits is, is very important. Finally, uh, this is just a, a sample of our simulated electromagnetic emission data taken by Stan Brzezinski and the NRL group. And this is frequency and time. These are spectrograms. And the thing labeled the downshifted maximum is a way of measuring field line irregularities and the production of lower Harvard waves. The, Picture on the right is the stimulated Brillouin scatter, which is used to measure the electron temperatures. And when it excites the electrostatic ion cyclotron mode, you can actually measure the mass of the ions. Uh, it's like an ion mass spectrometer. And Wayne Scales and his colleagues have measured O plus, H plus, and other ions over Arecibo using this technique. Finally, the uh, working with Noah, Terry Bullitt, the Viper people, uh, they have a number of inosons that you can scatter from the irregularities at Arecibo uh, using inosons. So in summary, I am hoping that Arecibo uh, becomes uh, reconstituted into a HF facility. And I've been proposing this ring beam uh, distribution for the dipoles with the secondary mesh and the right shows the HF beam that would illuminate the ionosphere. So in summary, the proposed Arecibo F HF system has a number of objectives, which includes 
exciting plasma wave irregularities and density clouds. So we can make our own plasma clouds with Arecibo, and that's been demonstrated. We can measure scintillations from a UHF uh, beacons, VHF beacons, GPS satellites, and radio wave propagation at HF. We can characterize artificial surrogates for natural ionospheric disturbance and provide validation for ionospheric modification models. The capability of the previous facility could be replicated with a 100 megawatt beam at 5.1 megahertz and 8 megahertz, uh, fairly narrow uh, 30 kilohertz bandwidth with different modes of operation to have a focus and defocus. We're, we're hoping that we can get an enhanced facility that extends the frequency range and the system bandwidth. Uh, I am proposing using a, a tangential ring of dipoles to, to add to the beam uniformity. And then with phasing, we could have different beam shapes. And finally, in summary, uh, these system upgrades are uh, in progress, both at Penn State and, and at my uh, location, University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, any comments or questions about that? Um, I did get a message from Dale Ferguson, and I think Paul is a co-author on a paper that's coming out uh, uh, with this uh, basically proposal for the Arecibo HF facility for rebuilding it. Yes, this is a, a paper that's uh, that's uh, almost uh, completely uh, approved now by the Journal of Astronomical Instrumentation, and it uh, it covers much of what uh, Paul was just talking about. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully they'll be out in the next couple months. Yep, I think those are a lot of good ideas for the HF. Um, any other comment? So I guess I'll hopefully I'll find my presentation and I'm gonna ha have a little broader view of Arecibo. I think that uh, to cut, cover not just aeronomy, although I, my focus is <laughs> probably a little most, a little more on aeronomy. Let's see, how do I do this preview? Full, full screen. Does that look okay? Looks good. Okay. So, um, How do I make it there? Okay, as mentioned, there's. If I, let me know if there's any, if any problems hearing or seeing. Um, there's significant support in Congress for rebuilding Arecibo. We're looking at trying to figure out a consensus design that will meet, that will uh, be able to achieve the science goals we're interested in. And um, so a few general questions uh, that I'm not going to answer here. I'm. I'm going to, I'm proposing some ideas and not really definite answers, but things to discuss and think about, such as should the rate, should, do we want an uh, expanded radio astronomy band, 30 megahertz to 30 gigahertz, or even 20 megahertz to 20 gigahertz or something like that. Um, a lower band below 300 megahertz was proposed before the collapse. And uh, there's something about that in also related to that in the NGAP paper. So, um, uh, does that meet radio astronomy science goals? And can, can we make a dish? Is it possible to make a dish with at least part of, uh, perhaps not an, an asymmetrical dish that covers a sufficient, sufficient amount of the Southern sky for astronomy goals? And then radars. Arecibo traditionally has, has had four radar systems, the, the S-band, which I'm calling something a generic system around four around four gigahertz frequency band, uh, the incurrent scatter around 400 megahertz. There have been various incarnations of a 40 megahertz uh, band radar, including a very powerful one that was used in the 1960s, and as various HF radars as well, and plus the HF facility and potential uses of radars mentioned by Paul. 
So the four gigahertz band radar would be used to improve that on past planetary measurements with the S-band radar, it could also be used for very high resolution measurements in the neutral atmosphere, as was the S-band radar, which was not designed for that. Perhaps we should design these radars for all science purposes to have maximum flexibility and maximum science return. For the 400 megahertz band radar, those the traditional ISR frequency, it could incorporate the vector and imaging methods that are being uh, built into ISCAT 3D and other radars in the world currently. And it could be used for planetary mid-depth uh, subsurface measurements. Um, the 430 megahertz was used for a lot of planetary observations, especially before the S-band, but even after. And, uh, an idea, and then an idea I had is perhaps it could be used to help object acquisition, but that might not be, a, that's just an idea I had. The 40 megahertz radar, this is a, a frequency that is being proposed for what's called the geospace radar, which would do vector and imaging measurements throughout the atmosphere using coherent and incoherent scatter at, at, on a much brighter, broader range of altitudes than the traditional incoherent scatter. It could also be used for deep subsurface studies of the moon and asteroids. And then there's the HF band, which Paul talked a lot of, about, but uh, uh, including ionosond and uh, high power radar applications. So uh, perhaps these four bands could be operated jointly or separately or independently in various ways that we could consider. I think it would be worth considering that all radars should be CW radars and have bi-static receivers. Do, mostly, for the most part, do away with pulsed radars. That would, I believe, increase flexibility and science possibilities. Um, so that with, if we, I think we could also include possibilities for looking parallel and perpendicular to the magnetic field, especially if we incorporate MIMO, which is multiple in, multiple out, which are modern vector radar techniques. And, and one of those ideas is a separate transmitting site, which could be built to look parallel and perpendicular to B. And a second site would allow non-interfering operations for, with radio astronomy, which is, has been a, a, a repeated complaint among the atmospheric science community that Arecibo uh, data is not available when they want it, when other radars along the American chain do have radar data available. And then there's uh, some comments about a heating facility. I think the, the frequency range could be expanded. This is beyond what Paul was talking about, not just a rebuild heating facility, but a heating facility for a new Arecibo uh, system. Um, two megahertz would give us the, gen the second harmonic. Up to 20 megahertz, we could have, I mean, the second gyro harmonic. Up to 20 mega megahertz, we could have subharmonics and, and harmonics of the transmitted HF frequency and many other science goals. So my question is, would, these, some of these ideas help energize the space and atmospheric science community, which I think has been one of the weaker points of the discussions about uh, rebuilding Arecibo. A little less, uh, not a tremendous amount of enthusiasm as I see it in atmospheric science up to this point. Um, then there's, uh, the, as mentioned, the Arecibo is on the American ISR chain. It's also, there's a great circle initiative that passes through that chain for it to that uh, addresses the entire globe, global atmospheric physics, and how would a new Arecibo, how could a new Arecibo contribute to that? As well as, in addition, Arecibo has a historic flexibility in the incorporation of new techniques, user-provided hardware, um, new ideas, and which has been valuable and perhaps would be valuable to retain in the future as a consideration on what design might be uh, recommended. Funding strategy, as I as mentioned, we're looking for a single thing to uh, uh, suggest to Congress uh, with a cost, a, a time scale, and we should also consider the cost to operate. Um, the general science related considerations we would like are more sensitivity for everything, uh, new capabilities for new things, and flexibility as mentioned for future new things. And then synergy with other new instruments should probably be considered. There are several low VHF solar radio arrays 
uh, operating. There's a proposal or a an upcoming proposal, I should say, for the low VHF geospace radar system in the subarctic. Um, there's a potential for one of those systems in New Mexico. Uh, and there's the new NGVLA NGVL uh, which with possible overlapping astronomical goals. And there's probably others that I'm not aware of or forgot. Um, in terms of incoherent scatter, there's ISCAT 3D, uh, which is a collaboration of European and American nations located in Europe. It's going to be a 200 megahertz multi-static imaging incoherent scatter radar, as I already mentioned, and as I think we should emulate. There's the Chinese radar, which has been mentioned, 440 megahertz. It will be a tri-static vector radar system as well, and it will be bi-static with FAST, the, the 500 meter uh, Chinese radio astrono astronomy dish. Um, and then I mentioned, already mentioned the ge geospace radar idea at low VHF. So here's a couple of, a few ideas. Uh, the main site, I, I um, am favoring a dish in the sinkhole, a receive only dish, low suspended weight, more flexible, if, with flexible operation. Put the transmitters one kilometer south of the dish for all of the high power radars. Um, maybe the HF would be at a separate location, also nearby the main dish. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, uh, remote receivers for vector measurements and MIMO measurements, a remote transmitter, so they could be operated so that a there is not always a conflict with radio astronomy for every measurement. Um, and uh, a multifunction HF radar, the kind of thing Paul mentioned, which is, a, this is a low power radar. The, the high power HF facility radar is a, an, another instrument. So here's a, a topo of the Arecibo site, showing the main dish, showing a, a large former farm about a kilometer south of the main dish. And there's one a couple of kilometers northeast dish of the main dish that could be used for these, uh, for transmitting arrays. And for the in particular for the planetary radar, I think that it might be worth considering whether a separate transmitter array would allow the planetary radar to reach Uranus. Uranus is at the top of the list in the recent planetary decadal survey. If you had a separate transmitter array for Uranus, you could track for three hours transmitting. And if you built a dish with enough, uh, possibly an asymmetric dish with, it, with enough receiving coverage to the west, you could receive for three hours and that would be plenty of uh, time to reach Uranus. Um, then there's for other sites, there's plenty of sites. These are just ones that I didn't even try very hard to find around Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And here's an, an idea of where you could put transmitters and receivers uh, for tri-static measurements with both of two transmitters and there's a, a, another receiver site in, that I put here in Los Caños for, to receive tristatic in the low atmosphere. So some, of, some or all of these sites could have uh, rings to fill out UV space to get high resolution aperture synthesis radar observations from the arrays, from the receiving arrays. So with those rings or half rings, you really only need half rings around the main uh, core um, this is a plot in UV space. The main core is the uh, UV coverage is the big circle in the center. And the, th and the three rings of UV circles are what the coverage is provided by the rings of outrigger antennas around the main array. So any, and here's a shot of the International Meridian Circle. Uh, Eresi was right on it, as mentioned. And I should also mention solar radar, a powerful low VHF radar system has the potential to, to look at the corona of the sun, perhaps coronal mass ejections and other heliospheric phenomena. So um, maybe we should do a, a little more work on science goals, especially related to the decadal survey. Um, that's already been discussed. And I think there's a number of, for, in terms of operational costs, I think there's a number of places where Arecibo might get commercial money, perhaps or in orbital debris, perhaps exploration of resources on the moon using the radar systems. Uh, ISCAT, the 3D is planning 200 megahertz observations of the moon. Um, 
so uh, I think there people see something in that. And then space mission support, both uh, human exploration and, and spacecraft, and as already mentioned, rocket system support from launches at Wallops and, and oops, Cape Canaveral. Um, and then we should consider looking at a green power for a new observatory, uh, at keeping that in mind and maybe not just taking whatever the electrical company gives us, but asking them to, to you know, work hard on, on green power. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So any comments or questions? Brett, on your planetary radar, I, I was focusing on using the HF, the uh, 100, 100 um, megawatt ERP facility. So you're actually thinking of uh, separate transmitters. Um, the, well, the HF, I'm, it, these are ideas. I mean, if you, you could build a, a more, a separate HF facility that is, it could use the dish for it as you're exactly like in your design, but it's also conceivable to build a new HF facility for the new AO2 design. Um, something to be discussed. I mean, what, what, what the best solution is or for what we wanna do. I'm not, advocating one over the other. And right. this, yeah, oh. thanks. Uh, uh, Brett, what is the power requirement for 40 megahertz transmitter? And also, do you need tracking for the 40 megahertz? If you want to use it for this, the sun, you need tracking. Yeah, or, or the moon or any asteroid. Yeah. Um, Power is, I think the high power transmitter powers figures such as in the NGAP proposal are, are good. For the sun, you, the transmitter power density is the number one figure of merit above any other. So um, that's very important if you wanna reach the sun and for many, and, and for sensitivity for many other things, you might want high power as well as is discussed in uh, the NGAP white paper. Yeah, thanks. Any other comment or question at the moment? So, okay, is it is it Mike's turn? I forget if it's Mike and Chris are coming up. <laughs> I think it's probably me, Brett. Yeah, it's Chris. Okay. Chris Salter. Uh, Brad, stop sharing. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. There. Okay, can you see my presentation? Not yet. We can see you. <laughs> you have my sympathy. <laughs> Should be able to see my presentation. Not yet. Huh. A bit of a pain in the rear end. Let me try again. Yeah, when you share, you have to click on your presentation. Okay. Do you want me to share it here, please? I think I'm probably going to give it to you now. Does that look better? Not there yet. Not yet. Got it? Speak to me, somebody. Oh, not there yet. Oh. Let me call in a... You have to push the share button down in the lower right-hand corner. Did you put you? I did. Again? And then put you? Yeah. Or, yeah. No, no, sorry, sorry. We have to put the share. There it is. There you go. That's it. Yeah. We see it. We see it, Chris. Okay, that's good. I'm sharing it, Chris, for you. 
Thank you very much. No, she shared it. So oh, Eliana yeah. shared it. So you Beautiful. have to ask her to change. Okay, it. if that's good enough, then I'll carry on from there. Then. Uh, okay, I am going to talk a little about uh, radio astronomy and AO2. I won't suggest any designs because I'm sure you all have better ideas than me. I'll just mention a few technical details and a few astronomical uh, things that maybe need bearing in mind in terms of uh, the future development. There we are. Spatial frequencies. That may not sound terribly relevant, but I thought I would uh, say a few words on spatial frequency responses of single dishes against interferometers, the two basic uh, concepts that have been mentioned. A uh, single dish has an upper spatial frequency set by its diameter, while an interferometer array uh, has an upper spatial frequency set by its longest spacing, that we all know. An interferometer array has a lower spatial frequency cutoff set by its minimum antenna separation. Uh, a single dish responds to spatial frequencies down to zero. Now, that may not sound very important. I'll show in a moment. It can be. Sometimes uh, the interferometer lower frequency cutoff is advantageous. Indeed, uh, single dish images often have their lowest spatial frequencies, the ones down to zero, removed uh, for very good reasons. For instance, we don't normally want the three degree K cosmic microwave background in our data. We uh, filter it out. In cases where we do want large scale structure, however, we may absolutely have to use a single dish, sometimes in combination with an interferometer. And to uh, show why that is, I include this slide from last year by uh, Dr. Buntala in uh, Bonn in Germany. The bottom picture here is his VLA DRA data of a region of the galactic plane. And uh, doesn't look terribly exciting, lots of small size sources. He then added into that the low spatial frequencies from the Bonn 100 meter telescope and gets the top very beautiful picture which I think you will agree certainly is far more instructive as to what is going on in that part of the galactic plane than is the bottom picture. Wow. Okay, a uh, few more comments on practical advantages of single dish observations. I'll give the disadvantages in a moment. Uh, low spatial frequencies, I mentioned that. Sensitivity. Point sources, the sensitivity, whether you have a single dish or an interferometer, depends critically on the collecting area. Uh, extended emission sensitivity in brightness temperature gets worse as the maximum baseline squared for the same collecting area. Uh, ability to map a very extended area quickly can be much better with a single dish. Uh, I would mention there the Arecibo, Alfalfa, and Galfax surveys, which covered a third of the sky uh, really relatively quickly. Uh, you can provide large collecting areas with manageable electronic complexity with single dishes. You have simplicity. Uh, you could, at a minimum, get away with one or two receiver chains if you want both polarizations not n receivers with n n minus one over two correlations. It's relatively simple to implement large focal plane arrays on a single dish, which can increase mapping speeds by orders of magnitude. Uh, Multi-frequency receivers are relatively straightforward investments on a single dish. You only need, again, one or two receivers at each frequency not uh, N for each one. Uh, flexibility, relatively ease in upgrading or customizing hardware for a particular experiment. You only have one 
receiver chain to customize relative ease of implementing implementing radar transmitter and treading on Mike Nolan's toes. I'll shut up there. A large single dish can add significant sensitivity to VLBA. VLBI arrays, I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, the software is often simpler. Conceptually, for novices, it's easier to understand as well. You can use single dishes as test beds for new receiver systems. You only have to build one to try it out. Uh, user developed equipment can be easily deployed on a single dish for a particular experiment. Uh, I can mention Tim Hankins, perhaps, and his extremely uh, high data rate taking experiments on the Crab Nebula there with Arecibo. And commensality, much used on AO1 as I'll call it, the legacy telescope, where uh, you can run a number of different experiments on the same piece of sky at the same time. Developed by Arecibo, now beginning to be used on GBT as well. Disadvantages. Limited high spatial frequency response. You can't easily just throw out another antenna a little further away. Mechanical structural complexity often replaces electronic complexity. That will come into discussions of this subcommittee quite a lot, I suspect. Susceptibility to instrumental drifts often in gain and noise. Uh, you don't have the correlation advantage of interferometers. Interferometers can, in principle, give high sensitivity and large total collecting areas. And one can mention there the SKA and, of course, NGVLA coming along. Aperture synthesis imaging is a form of multi beaming and arguably obtains more information from the radiation falling on the telescope than is possible, often with a single dish, without uh, added complexity to your single dish. Okay, finally, some relevant radio astronomy. Uh, what, do radio, what do single dishes do well? Pulsars, FRBs, and other transients. There are something like 3,200 known radio pulsars. I'm probably a bit out of date, thanks to FAST. Uh, the vast majority have been found with single dishes. The vast, vast majority. Uh, it would be nice to extend the detonation coverage for AO2 and give it new bits of sky to search. Uh, the nanograv uh, search for gravitational wave uh, detection at uh, very long wavelength gravitational waves. AO1 has been a major player in that for many years. Uh, FRB science, uh, FRB searches, whether with arrays or single dishes, with particularly phased array feeds or local plane arrays. Uh, are quite the thing these days. Uh, Arecibo are heavily involved in polarization and pulse structure studies of repeating FRBs. In fact, the first repeating FRB was found at Arecibo, shown to be a repeater. Uh, gamma ray afterglows, continuum studies, surveys like the Galfax survey that I show an example of on the right there, uh, needed uh, short or uh, low spatial frequencies, Arecibo provided it. Source imaging for adding into uh, synthesis data, red dwarf star studies and uh, exoplanet uh, searches, um, just starting when the telescope unfortunately collapsed. Uh, things that you don't foresee when you build the telescope. Uh, there was a big Interplanetary scintillation survey, uh, surveys starting just when the telescope uh, collapsed, run by Dr. Manoran at, uh, at Arecibo, uh, partly aronomy, partly astronomy, studying the solar wind and associated phenomena such as coronal mass ejections using interplanetary scintillations. Coronal mass ejections that never come near the Earth and won't be passing over any uh, spacecraft that are in orbit. 
uh, or playing around the sun. You can also use interplanetary scintillations to study comet plasma tails using the scintillation, extra scintillation as the comet tails pass over uh, radio sources. Uh, spectral line studies near to the heart of a number of the people in the audience today. Uh, searches for prebiotic molecules in the galaxies and in luminous infrared gal galaxies. Uh, wide area molecular line surveys in the galaxy and in extragalactic sources, luminous infrared galaxies particularly. Uh, IZ extragalactic molecules where uh, strong, highly redshifted maser lines are moved down to the frequency uh, range that uh, AO2 could study. Deep H1 blind searches take, uh, that were very successful with the uh, uh, alpha H1 searches. Uh, alpha alpha, of course, being a good example. H1 intensity mapping probing dark energy uh, via H1 emission at intermediate redshifts. Uh, H1 absorption study against continual emission of radionuclei, studying neutral gas in the host galaxies. H1 sensitivity, high sensitivity VLBI, uh, studies of galactic nuclei. H1 absorption against uh, galactic nuclei uh, in the host galaxies. Uh, localization of repeating FRBs. Arecibo was the, take, took part and was a major player in the first localization of an FRB, and its uh, high sensitivity essentially made that experiment possible. It was also instrumental in making a couple of hundred uh, measurements with the Radio Astron orbiting satellite, a small 10 meter dish in orbit can't do much without the biggest possible telescopes on Earth. And uh, the biggest possible telescope at uh, 5 and, five and 1.4 gigahertz was Arecibo and was uh, basically a great saver in that experiment and uh, also for Halka. Final slide coming up. Solar system radar, I'll leave that to Mike to talk about but clearly played a part. SETI searches done commensally with almost every experiment that took part there. And I would just add that single dishes do seem rather good at winning Nobel Prizes. And I have a quote, 1974, uh, 1978, 1993, and 2006. 1978 actually being due to uh, observations made at Arecibo. And at that point, I'll, uh, I'll uh, shut up. And if anyone has any questions, I'll do my best not to make too silly answers. Over to you, Brett. OK, any questions or comments? OK. Goody. No, sir. I appreciated those comments. And, uh, oh yes, uh, I got uh, I got a note waved in front of me saying G alpha. I should certainly mention the large uh, galactic alpha survey made of the whole galactic plane in H one, and was done almost totally commensally with other experiments carrying on, and so cost nothing. And that is something a single dish can do very very well. Um, Brett, this is Hector here. I'm reading the chat, and there's a comment from Mel Wright saying that it's it's power supply isolation needed for radar transmitter to avoid interference. This is, sounds like an engineering question. I assume I assume probably so, but uh, it's not really my department. I think a lot of these ideas. I think we as there may be a few uh, radar engineers in the audience, but. Um, I think for, that uh, my idea is to put out some ideas and then ask engineers what it would take to do them, you know, assuming that, you know, if they're possible and what it would take. So um, that's the next step. 
good. I don't see anything else in the chat. Okay, why don't we go on to Mike? Are you there? Mike yep. Nolan? Yeah. All I'm right. here. And I'm trying to do my thing here. Let's see. All right, I think I'm on. So uh, I'm going to give a short presentation on replacing the planetary radar capability. Um, this actually has nothing, I'm not going to say anything specific even about Arecibo, just what it is that we, that is needed. Uh, this is taken largely from the Team 6 presentation for the NSF 2021 workshop. Uh, um, a, a lot of this stuff was done at that workshop. A lot of the science cases were done at that workshop. Right, so we want to bring back the world's most powerful radar um, so that we can take pictures of all, of, right, of, of all the places we, that we've always been able to do. Um, with the loss of Arecibo, we lost the 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 the, the most powerful uh, radar in the in the in the world, and uh, there is one other one currently existing that can routinely observe asteroids and the planets. Uh, it 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 has as well. I always like to say it has a day job, which means it's part of the since it's part of the deep space smart work. It's not necessarily as available as a, de a dedicated telescope. And it's not necessarily as dedicated on a, on short term, so you can't. It, it quick response is not a strong point. Um, and of course, if we wanted to rebuild it, we would want to rebuild it better. Uh, the uh, Arecibo did all, a bunch of other things. Uh, asteroids was the thing I worked mostly on, but we also did a lot of work on the Moon, Mercury, um, some on Mars, and. Uh, out in uh, so, somewhat out into the outer solar system. I, I'm a little dubious about Uranus, but it, of course it's possible. So uh, the point of the asteroids mostly is uh, the or asteroids are interesting to, to planetary defense, uh, at, because, which has a certain public appeal because it dramatically reduces and quickly reduces the orbital uncertainties of a near-Earth object. If you discover a near-Earth object with an optical telescope, which is how they're always discovered, then you, uh, if you're able to get radar of it, you can, you can re reduce the orbital uncertainty uh, but by a huge amount, basically because the teles or optical telescopes measure plane of sky, um, orient position and velocity, and the radar measures uh, uh, line of sight, position and velocity. And so between them, you essentially get a complete orbit in a very short time. Uh, we also can characterize any uh, near-Earth objects uh, to see, basically see what they look like, uh, to some extent what they're made of. And I'm going to say that, so the re restoring the capability that was lost at Arecibo is called out in the Planetary Science Decadal Survey that came out a couple of weeks ago as a very high priority. And that is a new thing that uh, we didn't have before. So uh, the, this, we, we've been discovering at near Earth asteroids at, a, at an increasing rate, and that will con that will continue for some time. Uh, and one of the issues that is getting to the point where uh, the, some of the, a lot of the objects that are discovered can't be monitored except by the telescope that discovers them, because you need larger and larger telescopes. Uh, Radar can only see objects that are pretty close to the Earth, so there is some bias there. But we can, uh, I think it, it'll still be important. At, we'll have more and more things we can look at. Uh, of course, we also want to look at, so what, what do we want out of, out of this system? Uh, if you look at the, um, oops. Obviously, the, the larger the zenith angle range that you can cover, the more objects you can, you can look at. And, over the range from the old just under 20 degrees at Arecibo up to about a little over twice that, it's essentially linear. Uh, the, the more the more uh, rate, more sky coverage you get, the uh, the, the more zenith angle, uh, I guess, uh, declination coverage you get, the more objects you get are approximately linear. Eventually, of course, it will tail, tail off. And increasing the transmitter power is also more or less linear in the number of objects you could observe up to a factor of several. So that's that's worth doing if we can do it. 
So clearly we want to bring back the world's most powerful planetary radar. Uh, it would do science that really no, no other facility is able to do. We can look at uh, uh, not only near Earth asteroids, but main belt asteroids, uh, which, which we've done a little bit of over the years, but was always low enough signal to noise that it was not um, so not exciting. If we could increase the sensitivity, then we would be able to study more of those. And clearly we've uh, done a lot of radar studies of the terrestrial planets and moons. And a lot of that work is still current. A lot of the work on, on Mars and Venus is still relevant, even as we're sending uh, spacecraft there because just the wavelengths that we're using are different. And these can also be in support of some of those missions, right? If we're go going to the moon, there's, there, are, there are things we can do with the radar that are uh, that just a lot easier and quicker to do than if you tried to do um, didn't send like sending it. You, you could do a lot of reconnaissance of where it is you'd want to go. What are our desirements? Uh, we want obviously we want to increase the Nathango range as much as possible. More sky coverage, longer tracking times gives you longer observations. Obviously, increased power is always better. Uh, just for reference, Legacy Arecibo was 20 terawatts ERP, and so uh, more than that is better. Increased transmitter bandwidth that would that essentially achieves finer spatial resolution, uh, at least uh, yeah, finer spatial resolution, higher transmitter, higher operational frequency, effectively increases both ERP and the bandwidth uh, for for a comparable system. And multi-frequently capabilities is 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 a desirement. It's it would be very nice to have. It's not required to sort of do the fundamental mission. So lower frequencies for uh, to, for tomography and ground penetration, and possibly higher higher frequencies for uh, higher resolution. So basically, our requirements: we need high gain on bore site. Uh, right? We're just it's it's all about the power, and so. Uh, we need a large effective area, we need high transmitter power and high transmitter frequency, assuming those other things. However, we also need a wide beam because a lot of the objects we're looking at don't, we, we don't necessarily know where they are very well when uh, we start looking at them. And that means that you need the most compact possible area and actually a low transmitter frequency helps with that. And obviously we need good sky coverage. And so, Clearly, some of those uh, requirements a, a, a conflict. So the need to have both a wide beam and high gain pre presents a conflict. Uh, it means that if, it were, if a, an array transmitter system was used, it would need to be as compact as possible. Uh, and, and that's really pretty important. Uh, it would, and this is again why we might want to think of some sort of multi-frequency system where we had uh, two, two transmitter frequencies, a factor of several apart in frequency, where the lower frequency was the, was the workhorse frequency, which would be the highest power um, uh, de de detection uh, wavelength. And then we might have a, a high res frequency, that, a, a higher frequency that might be lower power that could only be used on really the best objects, but that would give us some additional capability there. And of course, having a, a a better penetrating wavelength of, of the kind that that Brett was talking about in the, in the uh, VHF-ish kind of range would uh, be have a lot of interesting ground penetrating uh, stuff, and that's and that's the extent of what I have. I'd be happy to entertain questions if any. Thank you, Mike. Excellent. Thank you. Questions. Comments. <laughs> so, um, well, well, I had one comment. This is excellent. Great, great job. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Mike. It was great. So, I think technically we have about five minutes left. Um, we were, we've already had some discussion. We were going to have a separate discussion, but I think we. We have had some. Um, we are interested in the possibility of uh, making, having future meetings and perhaps more specialized meetings focused on one or a, another uh, option where the science and the technical things could be discussed. Um, it depends on uh, what is of most interest to all of you. Um, so 
any comments about that? Any, um, and besides that, we, if we're, we should, I guess we should schedule a time for our next meeting uh, at the least. Um, yes? I have one comment. <laughs> Could you give me like a five minute extension for, for uh, use calibrations with the HF uh, RC booth facility? Well, how about that officially the meeting is supposed to end at two. So how about after two? I mean, but you, it could also be on a second meeting if we have a like a, another meeting in a week's time or something like that. Uh, yeah, sure. But I can give it now in, in three minutes. If you agree. Th You're the chair. Well, the, I think the first, the, the first priority is to uh, encourage people to send in, I guess, their, their interests. Um, uh, if they would like to participate in evaluating or, or discussing uh, any of these designs and the science that could be done with them. Um, and, uh, or things related to the science goals more generally and the decadal survey. I can't wait. Right, no, Chris, has, Chris Sauter has his uh, hand up. Okay. Um, hi, Brett. Uh, this is actually me. We are Tapasi. I'm, uh, we're sharing uh, uh, one Zoom. So I think originally our plan was to create kind of working group or basically the title of this meeting is from science to design, right? So since we uh, ran out of time today, as you said, we need to schedule another meeting. So would you, would you like to then form working groups or just have the discussion pretty soon, maybe even in a week or two weeks time or something like that? We need to, maybe we can take a vote of everyone. Like, do you want a meeting very soon within a week or two to come back to the discussion or form working groups right now and then come back to, uh, uh, meeting later on. Which way would you like to proceed? Um, given that we have two minutes, um, the most practical thing might be to have a second meeting and then dis discuss working groups and continue the discussion at that meeting. I think one needs to decide exactly how one is going to frame the working groups. Are they going to frame by, by science uh, direction, aeronomy, astronomy, radar? Are they going to frame by interest in a particular type of design uh, and uh, array, single dish, uh, reflect array, something else? Uh, perhaps that needs discussion before uh, deciding how the working groups if they are decided to be a good idea, are going to split up. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about the next meeting date as soon as we can. Yeah, if, if I may add though, to what Chris just said, uh, I think uh, we have heard a lot of uh, excellent ideas today and uh, excellent proposals as well. But what uh, we don't really have yet is uh, some kind of a protocol of a format on how we proceed from having working groups to actually uh, decide, select the science and the technical solutions that will allow us to get to the science that we want. Uh, some time ago, for example, I had suggested that we might follow a procedure that was very successful with uh, the NGVLA where they had these very successful community studies programs. And they started in 2016 and they had, uh, they are already at the fifth round of this community uh, studies program. And basically then they had uh, both the science advisory committee and the technical advisory committee that were functioning as, a, as an interface between the, the wide community and NREO. In our case, it's not, it's not very clear to me who is the stakeholder or stakeholders to which we report to, for example. 
we, we there's two things I think. First, we don't have the time that the NGVLA had. Every month that passes is one month further away from the collapse of the old instrument and one month for the con Congress and the NSF to lose focus on replacing AO. Uh, the, uh, the second thing I think is uh, that uh, ASAP is a think tank. Yeah, ASAP itself is uh, an NGO. It's, uh, I'm not sure actually uh, has anything except itself to report to uh, or to, uh, to produce uh, a document that it would then use to summon interest back again with the bodies I just mentioned. Hector, perhaps as uh, chair of uh, ASAP, you'd like to say something there. Um, well, I, I, I should, I wanna echo what Brett has been saying. And um, I think all this is good uh, discussion, but I think we wanna keep uh, our time. And I think all this should be done later. I see other people in the chat saying that we should have another meeting to organize this. Right. So yeah, I agree. I think, uh, I, I think it should be, we should do that. But I think it's a, it's a good idea, uh, Luca. Uh, maybe we can do something similar, but in a shorter time of uh, uh, time. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that was just an example. I mean, we don't have to yeah. do exactly the same thing, but I think at the, the format and the protocol on how we proceed to have priority over the science and the and the technical issues. I agree. I just posted a link on the chat uh, for you to fill before you are leaving the meeting. If you are interested in a particular aspect, if you can put your name and email and the interest, and then we should call for a next meeting. Yeah, plus we're, we're losing people by the minute too. So I just wanted to make sure that you know about that too. Yes, please, before you leave, if you can give us your information. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, please leave your information. And I, I think uh, Jan is eager to show a few slides if anyone wants to stick around. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can leave that, but one thing I would like to say is that uh, start step by step one step would be to to uh, to uh, get the hf facility working even with one dipole antenna so, so uh that that's my message to you don't don't ask for, for everything at once yeah there's different uh possibilities i think what paul talked about was more uh what we could do right now in terms of the hf right, facility right. I, I'll send you my slides and you can forward them to anybody. And one point, Brett, uh, as Nicole pointed to us right at the beginning, that uh, because Congress is seem to be willing to listen to RSU advocacy, so uh, we need to find a consensus as soon as possible. So that is basically our community's uh, driving force at the moment. Right? That's how I look at it. I think Tabazi raises a very good point. The one thing I believe Congress has intimated to us is that we need to coalesce around a particular idea, design, a particular idea, study yeah. that all of us, and there I mean the whole Arecibo community, can sign off on and uh, we have to be very careful that we do not split into yeah. three, four, or five warring uh, communities, each wanting something different and uh, not coming to any conclusion. Yeah. And also remembering that time and cost are of the essence. Yeah. Also, Brett's presentation had those guiding lines. Indeed, very clear indeed. I was today. pleased to see him have that. Uh, just sort of echoing the previous comments, I agree with uh, everything that he just said. Uh, I think 
we spent a while, at some previous meetings, we debated the merits of like a single dish versus an array, but that's really kind of putting the cart before the horse at this point. First, we just need engineering studies and funding for them to flush out those options in more detail. Just and just what, uh, one other thing that to, to might be a repeat is there are ideas for short term and long term, and I think the thing for Congress is long term. What um, on that time scale, uh, putting a dipole at the for the HF or several of them with a somewhat rebuilt dish is a relatively short term thing, which is beneficial, but is separate from the long term plan that we would like to propose to Congress. So I think we agreed we'll, we'll set up a, another meeting soon and continue the discussion. Right. I also want to highlight if you want to present like a technical proposal or, or have a presentation, we have the launch talks, we can use it. It would be nice if you can present on those, if you have ideas and um, use that space to present it, those. 